Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a couple lessons that we're going to have uh, on events connected to Paul's first missionary journey. This particular lesson is entitled Paul's First Missionary Journey. It's Lesson 7 for August 18 of 2018. Hope you enjoy these lessons as much as we are. Um, but as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for these wonderful records of what happened, the struggles and the challenges and the disappointments and the victories of your early church uh, leaders. We think of Paul. Someday we'll have the privilege of asking him in person about all these stories and learning many details that we no do not yet have. But for now, we're thankful for the records that are available to us, thanks to Dr. Luke. Be with us now as we consider the events of this first missionary journey is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we all know if we've studied or ever read the book of Acts or studied this part of Christian history before, that it took a number of steps to break down Jewish prejudice against Gentile converts. We've already had a lesson about Peter's experience with Cornelius, but now we're going to go take the next step and we'll see how that uh, works out. Um, let me just review what happened with, uh, what happened after the experience of Peter and Cornelius. It's in the last few verses of chapter 11 of Acts and it gives us a clue about how this breakdown really got started. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message to Jews only. But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene, where's Cyrene Libya. located? Libya. Libya. Libya today, went to Antioch. Where's Antioch? Syria. In those days, it's part of Turkey now, but it was a part of Syria in those days. So here we have. Christian missionaries going from Libya, if you can imagine it, to Syria, think about that today, and proclaim the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So that was the beginning of all this, and the incredible thing was that we don't even know the names of these first really Gentile missionaries. We know that this wasn't the end of problems. If you go to Galatians 2, you know the story of how Paul finally had to rebuke Peter and Barnabas for uh, their acting in prejudicial ways, but we'll talk more about that later. Well, what do we know, a little, what do we know about Antioch other than the fact that it was a large city in Syria? It was actually the third largest city in the Roman Empire, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I misquoted last week saying it was Damascus, not Damascus. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria. It was sometimes referred to as the Queen of the East. Um, and so that was the situation. It was a very multicultural city, multi-ethnic city. People from many parts of the world came there, as you can imagine, being the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And these non-Jews, well, we don't know for sure if they were non-Jews, possibly Hellenistic Jews, but people whose native country apparently was what we would call Libya today, traveled to what we would call Syria today, and said, we're not going to limit ourselves to speaking to Jews, we're going to spread the gospel also to non-Jews. Well, the excitement that developed in the church at Antioch as a result of the conversion of non-Jews led the church in Jerusalem to send Barnabas to see what was going on up there at Antioch. And so what do we know about Barnabas, just quickly? He was a Hellenistic Jew. He was a Hellenistic Jew, so Jerusalem wasn't his home. We don't know for sure why he was down there in Jerusalem, but he came originally from Cyprus. Cyprus. And so now here he is up there, and he sees the explosive growth of the church in Antioch, not only of Jews becoming Christians, but of non-Jews becoming Christians, and what does he do? He says, we need help. We need help! <laughs> and 
And he found help not too far away, a short distance across the bay. I don't know whether he took, went by boat or went by land, but not too far away was Tarsus, where Paul had been for the last estimates or six, seven, maybe eight years. We don't know exactly how long Paul was back home in Tarsus. But it does say that he was also evangelizing around in that area. It's possible that, that Paul may even have come to do some evangelization in Antioch before we, before we hear about this particular experience. So the two of them working together as an evangelistic duo made the church at Antioch just explode. Well, I have to ask a question. You, you know, I hope you all are familiar with the word serendipity. Uh, it's a means that sometimes something happens and then you get an unexpected result. What do you suppose might have been different if those unknown, unnamed missionaries had not gone from Cyprus and Cyrene to Antioch to begin preaching to non-Jews? What would have happened if Barnabas had stayed in Jerusalem instead of going to Antioch? And what would have happened if Barnabas had not decided to call Paul and brought him in from Tarsus? Would we ever have heard of Paul? Half of the New Testament would not have been written. <coughs> Almost half, not quite half. Well, of course, we, this is exciting for Christians, but you know the devil never gives up um, easily. And uh, As you were saying, the devil my, never gives up <laughs> easily. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The devil never gives up easily. Satan will always do his, if something exciting is happening in the church, you can bet that Satan is going to be there to do, interrupt whatever way he could. <coughs> so, as we've already mentioned, the Galatians 2, let's just read that quickly, Galatians 2, 11 to 14. But when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him in public because he was clearly wrong. This, of course, is Paul writing to the Galatians. Before some men who had been sent by James arrived there, Peter had been eating with the Gentile brothers and sisters. But after these men arrived, he drew back and would not eat with the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who were in favor of circumcising them. The other Jewish brothers and sisters also started acting like cowards along with Peter. And even Barnabas was swept away, swept along by their cowardly action. When I saw that they were not walking a straight path in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you have been living like a Gentile not like a Jew. How then can you try to force Gentiles to live like Jews? So you can see that the problem didn't fade away because of um, some missionary efforts in, in Antioch. Well, based on what we know of the history of the early Christian church, it seems clear that Antioch became the new headquarters for the Christian church. Now, here's a bit of trivia for our, pa our people here today. Where did the Jewish believer, the Christian believers, I'm sorry, the Christian believers at Jerusalem go when the, in AD 66, when uh, um, Domitian came and, and, no, Vespasian, Vespasian came and attacked, started to attack at Jerusalem. Pella? Pella, exactly. Where's Pella located? Jordan. Yeah, just across the Jordan River near the southern end of the Sea of Galilee. So that's where the, the, the Christians who had been in Jerusalem went and were saved from the later attack by Titus on, on Jerusalem. But that's still some 30 years in, in, in the future compared to what we're talking about right now. Something else happened there at, at, uh, in, in Antioch that we need to take note of. Um, the name Christ Christian? Yes, the name Christians. Why were they called Christians? Followers of Christ. Yeah. Followers of Christ, and we say that's a wonderful title, that's great. That's not what it meant at the beginning. <laughs> they said, These, those are those crazy people who are following a dead man. So it was, it was a mockery. The Christian, it was a derogatory yes. name. Yes, it was a derogatory name. That's a, exactly right. Well, of course, our focus of this particular lesson is now going to be Acts 13 and 14. And what happened to get that started? Do you remember? The church at Antioch said, let's send Paul and, and Barnabas out and evangelize. Okay. What do you suppose, why, 
I mean, why did they get that idea? We're not told. Okay. I don't think we're told. I don't, yeah. I don't think I saw. Is it possible that some of those people from Cyprus who had come and started the, 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 the speaking to the Gentiles or the non-Jewish non, well, non people in Antioch said, hey, you know, we left behind small groups of people over there in Cyprus. Why, why don't you go and see if you can get something started over there? We don't know, but that's a possibility. So what did, what did they do with Paul and Barnabas? They anointed. They anointed them. They gave them the right hand of fellowship and sent them off. And where did they go? Cyprus. Cyprus. And that should have been very comfortable for Barnabas because that was his home territory. Do you think they visited Barnabas' home church? We have, we have no idea. We don't know where his home church was located. But they worked their way across the island, all the way, I guess, for, for you watching, it would be from this side, going across, working their way west, all the way to Paphos, on the west, which was the capital, on the west end of, of Cyprus. Um, in any case, they, they, they landed in Salamis. That was the name of the place where they landed. And what happened when they got to Paphos? Remember? Oh, yeah. They, they met the Jewish sorcerer. Well, that wasn't the person they met first. The Roman governor. Yeah, apparently they had stirred up enough excitement on the island that they were welcomed to come and make a presentation before the Roman government. Governor. Sergius Paulus. Sergius Paulus, exactly. Exactly. And unfortunately, who else was there? A magician. A magician by the name of Elymas, and that was his name in Greek also known as Bar-Jesus. He was, he was a Jew. He was actually a Jew. And so um, the, we, we have some information about what happened at that point. Can you help us, Kerry? Yes. I'm going to be reading from Acts 13, verses 9 to 11. It's a good news translation from the American Bible Society. Then Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, he looked straight at the magician and said, You son of the devil, you are the enemy of everything that is good. You are full of all kinds of evil tricks and you always keep trying to turn the Lord's truths into lies. The Lord's hand will come down on you now. You will be blind and will not see the light of day for a time. Okay. Well, I don't know. If you had been Sergius Paulus, how do you think you would have responded to see something like that happen? It would open your eyes real quick. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting to notice that it specifically says he was impressed not so much by that miracle, but by the teachings of Paul and Barnabas. So, do you think we'll, we think we'll see this man in heaven? Mm -hmm. Quite possibly. possibly. What happened next? They fairly quickly, we don't know exactly how quickly, fairly quickly set off for Perga. Pamphylia, Perga and Pamphylia, that's right. So into what we now call southern Turkey. And if you know anything about the geography of southern Turkey, there's a couple things that are important there. There's a very high range of mountains that run just a little ways off the coast um, in the, along that southern part of Turkey. So it meant that if you're going to travel anywhere other than right on the coast, you're going to have to climb your way up through those mountains and over the top and down to the other side. We don't know what the reasons were, but John Mark, who had gone with Paul and, <coughs> and Barnabas, what did he do at that point? It was here that Mark, overwhelmed with fear and discouragement, wavered for a time in his purpose to give himself wholeheartedly to the Lord's work. Unused to hardships, he was disheartened by the perils and priv privations of the way. He had labored with success under favorable circumstances, but now amidst the opposition and perils that so often beset the pioneer worker, he failed to endure hardness as a good soldier of the cross. He had yet to learn to face danger and persecution and adversity with a brave heart. As the apostles advanced and still greater difficulties were apprehended, Mark was intimidated, and losing all courage, refused to go farther and returned to Jerusalem. 
That's Acts of the Apostles, page 169 and 170. So I'm sure that must have been a little bit discouraging for Paul and Barnabas. Remember, this is a pioneering effort. This is the first team that's gone out just into the unknown territory to see what they could do in terms of spreading the gospel. Now it's possible. That's Wouldn't you actually say that that team that went from went to Antioch was yeah. the first team that went out? Yeah, technically, I guess they would be. Yes. How uh, old do we think John Mark was at that time? His age is he a teenager? Well, is he a young okay. man? Okay. Uh, Jews looked at a man thirty as that's the time he really started. Yeah. What we idea? what we know is that he was a young man who followed well. Pretty good, pretty sure that he was a young man who followed Jesus and the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, mm -hmm. and that would have been in 31 AD. We're now talking about something that's happening about 42 AD, so it's another 10 years on his life, so mid 20s to maybe 30, probably something like Close. that. And you would think, you know, here he is walking with these old guys, you think you would have thought, okay, I, what do I need to be afraid of? You know, I'm tough. And old guys have more endurance, often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen to the marathon runner here. Okay, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> did they have any hint that their lives might be threatened at that point? We don't have record of it there. No record of it. Coming up soon, though. You think we would be willing to set out on a journey like this? I mean, imagine if someone said to you today, I would like you to... Uh, take off with maybe two other friends and I want you to go to central Russia or central China and see if you can start a mission there. Sure, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you about my, my wife's relatives, uh, you know, great aunts and great uncles, I guess, something like that. They went there to do that, two husbands, and they were supposed to be covering a fairly large area. This was back before World War II fairly large area in, uh, in um, southern, well, in central China, actually. And they were gone out, and on, on a, they were a couple of days away from home. They got a message, rush home quick, and they got home, and both their wives had been murdered. Oh. Yeah. Oh, man. Not a good story. Mm -mm. Well, you can understand why someone might be a little bit concerned about hauling off like this. Well, Paul knew it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be easy. He had been warned, right? How was Paul warned that things might not always be easy? The Lord himself told him. Yes. I'll well, show him. Not, not quite right. You, you got the general idea, but he, the Lord actually told Ananias. And we assume Ananias told Paul. I'm sure he must have. But actually, Acts 9, 15 to 16 says, The Lord said, I myself will show him all that he must but suffer I for my sake. I will show him. He's not talking to Paul. He's talking to Ananias. Yes. So the yeah. Lord was but going really, to show. The Lord's message. The yeah. Lord was going to show Paul directly. Yeah, that's true, Chad. So we don't know how often God communicated with, with Paul, Saul, Paul now, um, but um, yeah, he said it's not going to be easy. I want to think it was often, because in one the one. First Corinthians the seven, yeah. 7, I think. That's the only place where he says, I do not have a direct revelation from the Lord, but that's what I think. So, I want to think that he did communicate. Yeah. I don't think there's any question about the fact that one time he said, uh, I was up to the third heaven, remember? And so, yes, we know that uh, exactly God had communicated him with a number, a number of ways. <clears throat> well, what happened next? Look at Acts 13, 16 to 41. Paul stood up, motioned with his hand, and began to speak. Now this is, they have crossed the mountains now, um, and they're in Antioch and Pisidia. Now, let's be clear, this is not Antioch and Syria that they had left, but Antioch and Pisidia. And remember, why are there so many cities by the name of Antioch? Antiochus. Antiochus. A whole bunch of Antiochus has ruled that area. So they're actually, by the time they got done, there were like something like 15 cities in that part of the world called Antioch of this, Antioch of that, Antioch of something else. So this is Antioch of Pisidia. So they crossed over the mountains, and on the Sabbath they went into the, syn Sabbath, they went into the synagogue and sat down. 
after the reading from the Law of Moses, I'm reading from verse 15 now, and from the writings of the prophets, the officials of the synagogue sent them a message. Brothers and sisters, we want you to speak to the people if you have a message and encouragement for them. Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and began to speak. So now I have you, I'm going to ask, before I read on, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think Paul, when he went into these synagogues and his missionary journeys, ever mentioned to them, oh, by the way, I used to be a member of the Sanhedrin? <laughs> <clears throat> it certainly might have got their attention to start with and gotten him an invitation to preach. Yeah. Possibly they, they knew of him anyway. Yeah, it's possible. Well, intelligentsia. Well, of course, his message is fairly straightforward. Fellow Israelites and all Gentiles here who worship God, hear me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors and made the people a great nation during the time they lived as foreigners in Egypt. God brought them out of Egypt by his great power, and for 40 years he endured them in the desert. He destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan and made his people the owners of the land. All of this took about 450 years. After this, he gave them judges until the time of the prophet Samuel. And when they asked for a king, God gave them Saul, son of Kish, from the tribe of Benjamin. And I don't wonder if Paul would have mentioned that, yeah, that's how I got my name. Uh, to be their king for 40 years. After removing him, God made David their king. This is what God said about him. I have found that David, son of Jesse, is the kind of man I like, a man who will do all I want him to do. It was Jesus, a descendant of David, whom God made the savior of the people of Israel, as he had promised. Before Jesus began his work, John preached to all the people of Israel that they should turn from their sins and be baptized. And as John was about to finish his mission, he said to the people, Who do you think I am? I'm not the one you're waiting for, but listen, he is coming after me and I am not good enough to take his sandals off of his feet. My fellow Israelites, descendants of Abraham and all the Gentiles here who worship God, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. And of course, he goes on. Uh, I don't have time to read his entire sermon there. Of course, it's not even close to his entire sermon. What we have here takes about, what, three or four minutes to read? And I'm sure he, how long do you suppose he preached? Must have been at least an hour. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he's preached through into the night, midnight. Yep. We know about that. Yes. Um, well, there's another sermon recorded, which we're not going to read right now, Second Corinthians <clears throat> 4, 7 through 12, but they give us example, examples of the kind of sermons that Paul would preach. And what we have, of course, is just a brief summary. And we know that Paul preached again and again and again many sermons. And we notice a general pattern similar to the sermons of Stephen back in, in, in Acts uh, 7 and Peter recorded elsewhere, divided into three parts. When they spoke to Jews, they would say, first of all, look, here's the history of our people. There are prophecies from that history talking about a Messiah who's coming. Let me tell you, that Messiah has arrived and his name is Jesus. And this is da -da 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 -da, details of his life. And then finally ends up by saying, don't make the mistake of rejecting him. This is the Jewish Messiah. You need to accept him. So that was basically the tenor of his uh, sermon. Well, the Jewish Christians had come to believe that salvation came through keeping the law according to their Jewish customs. Paul made it very clear that keeping the law was important, but it never could bring salvation. Jim? My brothers and sisters, how I wish with all my heart that my own people might be saved. How I pray to God for them. I can assure you that they are deeply devoted to God, but their devotion is not based on true knowledge. They have never known the way in which God puts people right with himself. And instead, they have tried to set up their own way. And so they did not submit themselves to God's way of putting people right. For Christ has brought the law to an end so that everyone who believes is put right with God. Wow. That's that, a good news Bible. Yeah. And Gordon, I think you have some words to add to that. And then from Galatians 2.16, also good news Bible. Yet we know that a person is put right with God only through faith in Jesus Christ, never by doing what the law requires. We too have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be put right with God through our faith in Christ. 
and not by doing what the law requires. For no one is put right with God by doing what the law requires. Now, if you had known when Paul started talking that he was a former member of the Sanhedrin, would you be surprised by these words? <laughs> You'd probably be shocked. Shocked. Uh, if you knew much about the Pharisees and the yeah. Sanhedrin, you would He be was shocked. a Pharisee. Remember, yeah. he was a Pharisee. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what should be our understanding of the relationship between keeping the commandments of which, for which Seventh-day Adventists have become famous and the process of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? Well, the Bible says repeatedly in the New Testament, salvation comes only through Jesus Christ himself. For example, Acts 15, 10, Romans 8, 3. We can be transformed into children of the heavenly king only by following the example of Jesus. Remember, Acts 4, 12 is another verse that's very famous for that. When, when that is our goal, the Holy Spirit steps in, forgiving our past sins and helping us to live a new life. Can we, can we make the changes necessary for salvation ourselves? No. What kind of help do we need? <clears throat> we need God. Divine help. We need Christ's help. Yeah, yeah. we need divine the help. Spirit, we need the Holy, we need the Holy Spirit. We need Christ. Gift, and it's always available. Exactly. If you're open to it, listening. Exactly. And what I ask people sometimes is, okay, who do you think is holding this process back? Do you think it's the Holy Spirit or might, might it be you? <laughs> I think there's any question about God's participation in this process. He loves any opportunity we give for him to step in and but do anything. Yes, St. Paul is not contradicting what the Bible talks about. No. And here are they, here, here they who keep the commandment of God and have faith in Jesus Christ to him that overcometh. Yeah. Um, after spending so many years in Adventist school, I had to go to a non-Adventist school for some time. And, uh, and when no one was watching me, it was a joy to partake of the blessings of the Sabbath. Yes. Sabbath really truly became a delight yes. at the time. So perhaps the ones who have a wonderful walk with the Lord, they don't even think about, I'm not, today I didn't lie. Today I did not steal something from whoever. <laughs> we don't anymore because yeah. we walk with him. Yeah, yeah. I, I had that same experience. Um, I went and took my master's in public health at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And the Sabbaths were just, we had a marvelous experience in a small church there in northern Baltimore that was during that time, just fantastic. Well. When Paul and Barnabas were working there, they were at first welcomed by the Jewish community. But when the Jewish congregation of the synagogue saw the incredible response of the, among Gentiles, their natural prejudice <laughs> arose. There was a big change in their attitude. And what happened? The change wasn't good. <laughs> the change wasn't for the better, huh? Well, let's just review the situation a little bit. We know that the Jewish people were great businessmen, and they had spread out. Jews had spread out all over the Mediterranean world as businessmen, here and there and so forth. And any place where there was a more than 10, the rule was if there's more than 10 families in a given place, Jewish families, they have to establish a synagogue. And basically that was happened. These are the places that Paul would go and start out his, his ministry in each place, each city he went to. Well, how did these Jewish groups, how did they impact their neighbors and their friends? Well, think about what the rest of the world was doing at that point in time. There were fertility cult religions. There, were the, there was the polytheism among Romans and Greeks and so forth with all kinds of craziness going on. So there were a certain number of, a certain percentage of the population that saw the, the superiority of the Jewish religion, one God, and a healthy lifestyle, and maintaining a worshipful service so we could come, come together and someone would stand up and actually say something intelligent, you know? So a large number of Gentiles were attracted and joined various synagogues in many places. <coughs> but for various reasons, they were reluctant to accept the Jewish practice of circumcision. I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> Many considered it a barbaric and disgusting practice. 
Or this folk from San Francisco, by any chance? Yes. <laughs> some, those people who regularly attended the synagogues and attended most of the Jewish religion, nevertheless, did not become fully Jewish converts because they didn't want to be circumcised. So they became known as God-fearers. Mm -hmm. God-fearers. So you could be a regular member of the congregation, you could come to all the services, etc., but if you didn't go all the way and get circumcised and follow all the ceremony requirements, you were a God-fearer, not a real Jew. And it was probably these God-fearers that got excited about Paul's message and started telling all their neighbors, so what happened the next Sabbath? The whole city came. The whole city showed up. Now, is that what the centurion was? Uh, that Jesus... That Probably the centurion in Capernaum and also yeah, the Jesus centurion helped. in Caesarea that where, yeah. where Peter later went. We were told that he fears God. Yeah. That's a God-fearer. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Well, it's interesting to notice in passing, for those of us who believe in the Seventh-day Sabbath, to notice that they just met on Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that um, Paul and Barnabas were taking a vacation in between times? No. They were working every day, seven they, days. They were no doubt going from house to house, spreading the gospel, talking with believers, etc. I'm sure they were very active. Well, there was that incredible response, and what, what was the Jewish response to that response? They were very jealous. jealous. Yeah, the, yeah, the Jews saw the crowds as they were filled with jealousy. Yeah, yep. yep. Well, they stirred up the leading people of the city and started a persecution which forced Paul and Barnabas to leave the area, and they traveled on to a place called Iconium. By the way, Iconium is still a very major city in uh, Turkey today. It now is called Konya, K-O-N-Y-A. We were able to visit there a couple years ago. We were able, as we went there, we were told that there was one Christian church in the whole city. But he said, you are not going to be able to see it. We'll drive by it. We'll stop there, and you can look if you want. But it has to be locked. It has to be kept locked. And we, we drove up there, and we were taking, starting to take some pictures of the church. And lo and behold, here came this group from group of Christians uh, from, um, oh boy, um, can't think of the name of the country, Catholic Christians. And they had made arrangements to go in to this church. So they unlocked the church, they went in, had a service there, and um, well, they're from Warsaw, Poland, is the name of the place. Um, and so we were able to go in and see this one church, still in Iconium, one Christian church. It's, it's maintained by two Greek Orthodox uh, uh, nuns who are allowed to stay there and keep the place and preserve it, take care of it, but it, it cannot be open. Remember, it's against the law to convert a Muslim to become a Christian. Oh, so they're worried about vandalism then. <coughs> well, so sure, and tearing it down. destruction and who knows whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so. They're brave nuns. Anyway, yeah. Once again, while many both of Jews and Gentiles were attracted by the message, others were vehemently opposed. When Paul and Barnabas got the message that their enemies were planning to stone them, they quickly left the city of Iconium and went to Lystra and Derby. Now, list, what do we know about Lystra and Derby? Anything other than what's in the Bible? Turns out that there was a small, independent kind of nation there, an old, what used to be Turkey, Asia Minor, and these were border cities on, in, that, in that little country. So they were never very big cities of any kind. Lystra, if you, I visited there. Lystra, if you visit there now, no archaeology has been done there. It's a, it's a tell, uh, just a mound of dirt you can see there. If you walk around, you can pick up things mm. from, from probably the days of Paul, mm. just lying on the ground. And there's a, a place not far away where they have uh, collected some of the major things that were just lying on the ground and made a little outdoor museum that you can see some of these things. But uh, it never amounted to much. This is still in Turkey? It is still in Turkey, yes. And Derby is about the same. It's a little farther away. Uh, I have not <coughs> been there. Are there coastal towns then? No, these are, these are inside, over the mountains, down into the, into the central part of, of Turkey. 
Yeah. My map has them just south and southeast of uh, Iconium. Iconium. Yes, that's correct. And yeah. Iconium is the same thing, south and a little east of uh, Antioch. Yeah. Antioch of Pisidia, remember. Yeah, no, that's correct. So anyway, let's move on. We, we don't want to rush, run, run out of time. Well, we know that um, despite these terrible uh, experiences, Paul was still very committed to trying to reach out to these Jews. I mean, these were his, these were his brothers and sisters. They were fellow Jews. Um, so what do we know about that? that I think, Myra, we've okay. got, you've got a comment about yes. that? Paul's argument in Romans 9 to 11 offers further explanation of the mission strategy he pursues in the narrative of Acts mm -hmm. and confronts every generation of Jews with the theological Christians. Christians, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know where that, oh, it's below that, that's why. Um, every generation of Christians with the theological importance of bearing witness to unbelieving Jews. It's from David Peterson. David D. Peterson, G. Peterson. I can tell you that um, we had the privilege of visiting Israel in probably 7, 1973, not too long after the Six Day War. And the number of Adventists in that whole country was no more than a handful. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, there was a little bit more up in Nazareth and that area and just a very few down in, in Jerusalem. But the church is growing there. Was there. I was there a couple years ago, and there's not only, they now have multiple services on Sabbath in different languages because there's people who've come into Israel from various parts of, of the Middle East and from Europe and so forth, and so they have services in different languages in the church there in Jerusalem. And there's a thriving church in the Arab-speaking part of Israel up um, in, uh, in Nazareth. And there's some others too. I, I, I'm not trying to give a full history of the Adventist Church in Israel. Well, we don't know what kind of what, we, what to understand what happened next. We read need, we need to read Acts uh, 14, starting with verse 8. In Lystra, there was a man who had been lame from birth and had never been able to walk. He sat there and listened to Paul's words. Paul saw that he believed and could be healed, so he looked straight at him and said in a loud voice, "Stand up straight on your feet." The man jumped up and started walking around. I, I, try to, I try to imagine myself how I would respond or something like that. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they started shouting in their own Laconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. They gave Barnabas the name Zeus and Paul the name Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of the god Zeus, whose temple stood just outside the town, brought bulls and flowers to the gate for he and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifices to the apostles. When Barnabas and Paul heard what they were about to do, they tore their clothes and ran into the middle of the crowd shouting, why are you doing this? We ourselves are only human beings like you. We're here to announce the good news, to turn you away from those worth, these worthless things to the living God who made heaven, earth, sea, and all that is in them. In the past, he allowed all people to go their own way, but he has always given evidence of his existence by the good things he does. He gives you rain from heaven and crops. At the right times, he gives you food and fills your hearts with happiness. Even with these words, apostles could hardly keep the crowd from offering a sacrifice to them. Some Jews came from Antioch and Pisidia and from Iconium. They won the crowd over to their side, stoned Paul, and dragged him out of the town, thinking he was dead. Paul... Um, but when the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into the town. The next day, he and Barnabas went to Derby, and some more or less something more or less similar happened so, when they so got they up. stoned Paul. Hmm? Where was Barnabas? I don't know. He evidently got away. And Apparently, he got away. Well, where did the people from Lystra get the idea that these guys might be gods? Because he healed the man who had been. <coughs> since birth. Exactly. Jim, I think you have something about that. The Latin poet Ovid, 43 BC to uh, 17 or 18 D AD, had earlier recorded a legend of these same two gods disguised as humans visiting a town in the same area, the hills of Phrygia, and seeking a place to rest 
Although to the legend, a humble elderly couple treated them kindly and with hospitality, the rest of the people were indifferent. Because of their kindness and hospitality toward the incognito visitors, the couple had their house transformed into a temple and themselves into priests, while the rest of the town was completely destroyed. It's from Metamorphosis 611 to 724 from the Adventist uh, well, quoted from the Bible Adventist, Study Guide. From our Bible Study Guide. So you can see why, you know, if they had this kind of belief, they might have said, whoa, look, the gods have come down again. We don't want to be wiped out. We would like to be among the ones who, who, are, bene who, who, who are blessed. Well, we don't know how much time Paul and Barnabas were allowed to continue preaching in Lystra, nor do we know what kind of response they got from the Lystran people. What we do know is that some of Paul's opponents from Antioch and Iconium were so moved by their opposition to Paul that they stirred up rebellion against Paul's preaching in Lystra. Well, how many of us would be willing to continue our missionary efforts after being stoned? Those things didn't seem to phase Paul. They must have assumed that he was dead, the people that did the stoning. Yeah. They he, dragged him out of town and left him for dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Would that be called a miracle healing? Well, we don't know how seriously, whether he was just briefly unconscious or whether he was seriously damaged. I mean, he could have had a, a hemorrhage, a brain hemorrhage, or who knows what. And may have been, God may have had to per completely heal him. We just don't know. Well, he rose up and mm. entered the city. Yeah. So he was able to get up and walk. Yeah. But well, was that after a miracle from God or was that after yeah. he just woke up? When you look at the entire history of Paul's movements, it's a wonder he survived much of anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they yeah. got him going and coming. It yeah. was just... <laughs> well, what did they do next? They decided to go back to the same route they had just left each place they, 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 they visited, they strengthened the church, they appointed elders to be leaders. And you wonder, I mean, what kind of, what did they leave them with? I mean, there were no gospels yet been written. Uh, did they say, you know, there's a man by the name of Jesus? Well, thank you very much. What do you know about him? Well, we don't have time to tell you that. <laughs> but it's not, it's not quite that bad because we know that the entire journey that they took took about two years. So they, they spent some time. And so when they went back to these towns and, and s established churches, they probably left them with s at least a few people who had a pretty good idea what Christianity was all about and could be leaders in the church congregations in, in those areas. Do you have any information if some of these folk had access to the Old Testament? Well, the Jewish synagogue would have to have access to, to at least some yes. of the Old Testament. Yes. So these Christians perhaps could put things together. Yeah. So yeah, this makes sense. Two plus two is four. Yeah, and in and, and every place they went, I'm sure they, they, they got some Jews to become, to be followers. How old do we think Paul was around what age at that time? Well, it's you know, hard to know. He had to be a certain age to be a member of the Sanhedrin. He had to be 30. Okay, at least he's he's probably this. And that would have been uh, in the year, uh, we're talking about AD 34, he was 30. So he he's was born ab about the same time Jesus was. So okay. we're now talking something that's happening in the mid 40s. So that's where, that's where Paul was. He's not a kid. He's not a kid. No. It certainly would have taken some courage to, for Paul and Barnabas to go back through these same towns where they'd been chased out of town and even stoned. Yeah. You know, yep. Did they go disguised? Put on a mustache? Or, uh, <laughs> I don't know, but I, I suspect they were, they were cautious. <clears throat> I mean, you know. It was a few years later, too. Yeah, yeah a little it wasn't while. wasn't just two or three months. Well, we don't know. Some, some of the some, some of the first been. ones it must have been just a couple of months, because they turned around and started back. So they went back to all the same places they had been. Finally, they up down on the on the coast, and they preached in Perga and Attila, and then they sailed back to Antioch and Syria. And this is still their first. This is still their journey. first missionary journey. Well, having reviewed their experiences, Paul and Barnabas, what do you think they said to the church when they arrived back in Antioch of Syria? I mean, the church had sent them out, probably gave them money, almost certainly gave them money to get, at least get started. 
and sent them on their way, and two years have gone by. And do you think they're, we don't know whether they send any messages back in the course of the way? They went that far away, so it would have been possible if they found somebody who was headed back to Antioch, they could have sent a message, but we just don't have any information about that kind of stuff. So when they got back there, I'm sure they had plenty of stories to tell. I mean, look at the brief accounts we had. Do you, we have a, a, a records of one or possibly, to be, if you consider the Elemis thing, a miracle, two miracles. And you can be sure that there were a lot more miracles because it actually mentions miracles in the plural in, this, in the story. So um, what do you think? They, do you think they wanted to have, take Paul to the doctor and check him out to see if he was okay? Too bad they didn't have uh, pictures uh, to give a slideshow and movies of the yep. of this. You know, that would have been quite a quite a vesper service. Yeah. Or a week or a month. What do you think you would have done if you were Paul at that point? Do we know what he did? He and Barnabas went back to their business of evangelism in Antioch. Well, would you have decided, if you were Paul or Barnabas, would you have said, well, it's too much trouble trying to deal with the Jews. We'll just go and we'll pre preach straight to, the, straight to the Gentiles. Why didn't they do that? Wouldn't that have been smarter? They had a burden for the Jews. Exactly. Exactly. Paul had a real burden for the Jews. Yeah. So he said, he, it's like walking into the lion's mouth, you know. Well, um, Charles, I think you've got something about what happened next. During the life of Christ on earth, he had sought to lead the Jews out of their exclusiveness. The conversion of the centurion and of the Syrophoenician woman were instances of his direct work outside of the acknowledged people of Israel. The time had now come for active and continued work among the Gentiles, of whom whole communities received the gospel gladly and glorified God for the light of an intelligent faith. The unbelief and malice of the Jews did not turn aside the purpose of God, for a new Israel was grafted into the old olive tree. The synagogues were closed against the apostles but private houses were thrown open wide for their use, and public buildings of the Gentiles were also used in which to preach the word of God. Ellen White sketches from the life of Paul, page 51. In all their missionary endeavors, Paul and Barnabas... Let me interrupt for just a sure. second. So, what we find now is that the Christian churches are meeting where? In, in private homes. homes. Now, what was the status of the Christian church at this point? Legally or... or they were not, they were not, it was not organized. Well, not just not organized, it was illegal. illegal. It was a completely illegal church at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Because the Roman government, the idea was, okay, we have our religion. We like everybody to join our religion. But when they conquered a nation, they, they realized it wouldn't be possible for them to make a whole nation change their religion. So if they, when they conquered the Jews, they said, well, you know, so long as you don't give us a bad time about our religion, we'll let you worship your religion. But we forbid the establishment of any, establishment of any new religions. So why would, why would that be? Why would they forbid the establishment of a new religion? Because they were still scared of the Romans, perhaps. That the Romans would come down on them. No, but we're no, talking no, about why, the Romans. No, no, no. Why would the Romans be oh. opposed to the starting of any new religion? Because some of their leaders classed themselves as gods. They didn't want the opposition. Okay, but there's a, there's a better reason than that. Or is now, it, I'm not arguing with that at all. Or is it the, they had enough uh, trouble handling the Jews? They didn't want someone else? That is also a part of it, but I think there's an even more important reason. What happens when you get a brand new church starting? It's happened again and again. People are on fire for what they believe. And they don't care about what the government says. They don't care about anything. I mean, their lives are committed to the, to the building up of that church. And very often it's in opposition to the establishment, either the government or the local church or whatever. 
So it was against the law to establish a new religion. So all of what Paul and Barnabas are doing here is illegal. I've always thought, really, that the Romans didn't care that much. But the strict Jews did. They didn't want any competition. Well, the Romans didn't really make a big deal out of it yet because they, it was such a small thing, they didn't think there was any big deal. But we know a little bit later, of course, both Peter and Paul were killed and there was terrible persecutions that came eventually. Okay, so I'm sorry, go ahead. In all their missionary endeavors, Paul and Barnabas sought to follow Christ's example of willing sacrifice and faithful, earnest labor for souls. Wide awake, zealous, and tiring, they did not consult inclination or personal ease, but with prayerful anxiety and unceasing activity, they sowed the seed of truth. And with, with the sowing of the seed, the apostles were careful to give to all who took their stand for the gospel practical instruction that was of untold value. The spirit of earnestness and godly fear made upon the hearts of the new disciples a lasting impression regarding the importance of the gospel message. Mm -hmm. Acts of the Apostles 186. So here's, that's just my point that I was making. When, when people really be, became, were gripped by the excitement of this new religion and the commitment to God and the fact that God would protect them, etc., and could perform miracles, they, they just went out and said, I don't care what the government says, this is what we're going to preach, this is what we're going to talk about. Well, in our story so far, we must recognize that John Mark had been a disappointment. But Barnabas was willing to overlook his former mistakes and invite him to join them when they went on their next journey. Paul was adamantly opposed to that idea. You can read about that in Acts 15, 37. However, two important things need to be remembered about John Mark's subsequent ministry, because we don't want to put down on John Mark too much. One, he apparently was closely associated with Peter for some time later in his ministry. Two, finally at the end of his life, Peter recognized John Paul. Mark's, Paul, I'm sorry, Paul recognized his usefulness and said, get Mark and bring him with you for he is useful for me, to me for ministry, 2 Timothy 4:11. And three, going along with that, while in Rome, where Paul and Peter were in prison, John Mark, working with Peter, wrote that first gospel, which we call Mark. So he's the, and all the other gospels except John were patterned, I mean, Matthew and Luke are both patterned to a considerable extent after Mark's gospel. They quoted a lot of it. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> well, after reading of these experiences of Paul and Barnabas, what should we do? Do we need to travel across oceans and learn new languages and new cultures in order to spread the gospel? No, not at all. We can, what can we learn from these experiences that would help us to be more effective witnesses even to those around us? A phrase up in what Charles had just read caught my attention. Yes. Because I think it's very important for us now in our day, in our, in our interaction with other people. I meet new people all the time three days a week, I'm constantly associating with the new people who are eating lunch, and I just am taken with this, the light of an intelligent faith. Yes. How do we look when we talk about our belief? Yes. Are we overbearing or dogmatic? Or is it look, does it look intelligent to other people? We certainly don't have any prejudices, right? <laughs> None of our prejudices could ever have hindered the spreading of the gospel. Are there any any beliefs that we have held, maybe even for a long time, that are not correct? Could God pour out on us the Holy Spirit and lateral any <coughs> power if we are not correctly representing Him? What do we need to do? Prepare ourselves for the latter rain. Does, does your local church out there, does it have a plan for mission service? Do you have a, a plan, an organized plan to, to reach out to your community or maybe reach out to another small town or city not far from you where there aren't any Adventist churches? What, shouldn't we have plans like that? Why is it so easy for Adventists to congregate small, comfortable Adventist, do I dare call them ghettos, and fail to reach out to their neighbors and friends? Are there attitudes and beliefs that prevents Seventh-day Adventists today from doing the work that should be done in spreading the gospel? 
Do we have any prejudices that might be in some way similar to the Jewish prejudices that Paul and Barnabas faced? Well, have you personally made a practice to ask for guidance from the Holy Spirit in your mission to those around you? What would happen if everyone in your church did that? Could a group of Seventh-day Adventists formulate a plan to spread the gospel, even in your local community? It is so easy for us to think that the work of spreading the gospel is a pastor's work. What would happen if our, to our churches if we started thinking that spreading the gospel was our work? If your church has a plan to reach out to other areas to try to spread the gospel, have you reached out to people in that community to say, help us get organized? What, what's the best way to reach the people in your area? We must never think that the work of spreading the gospel is primarily our work. Let's not make that mistake. It is the work of the Holy Spirit, but we can gain a blessing by joining with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And some examples? The plan to leave Ur did not originate in Abraham's mind. Moses did not issue on his own the call for freedom. Joshua did not choose to split, to split the Jordan River. Isaiah did not pick his career as a prophet. Daniel did not invent the prophetic telescope. Esther did not choose to deliver the Jews. Peter didn't leave the fishing net on his own. Neither did Saul become Christianity's first great missionary on his own. In each case, the Holy Spirit made the call. Does that give us an excuse to sit back and wait and say, well, when the Holy Spirit calls me, I'll do something? Kind of hit Saul slash Paul over the head with a two by four. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to notice that there were prophets, teachers, and possibly some high government officials mentioned in the city of Antioch. I thought prophets were just in the Old Testament. Were there prophets in the New Testament? Yes. They're named, and we're going to find out pretty soon that there's some other specifically named prophets that went to Antioch. Well, we must never fear that God, I mean, that the devil will roll over and play dead as we spread the gospel. Well, we're running out of time, but uh, it's in one more thing that's of interest. Up to this point in time in their discussions, or at the, at the beginning of the missionary journey, we have the names Barnabas and Paul. But following... The, the travel to Cyprus, it was Paul, no longer, I mean, Barnabas and Saul. It's no longer Saul, it's now Paul and Barnabas as they continued with their journey. Our kind and loving Father, we're inspired by this record of the endeavors undertaken by Paul and Barnabas. Two years wandering homeless out through these territories, never knowing for sure what was going to happen the next place they went never being sure about what kind of reception they would receive, either from the Jews or from the Gentiles, and yet they moved forward, and they kept going, and they kept going. We don't even know how far they had to walk. It must have been many, many, many miles. And Lord, we here we are at comfortable times. We have the Internet. We have telephones. We have radio. We have television. We have all these mechanisms that we can use to spread the gospel. And what are we doing? Of course, we have a lot more people to reach in our day than they had in their day, but there's so many ways in which we can reach out. Help us to have the courage to do so is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.